Welcome to Good Friday at Calvary Chapel, Wichita. Glad that you could join us tonight for a message entitled, The Darkness Over the Land. Turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26 and 27. We'll be home base this evening. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Jim, could you help people out with Bibles, please? Just by way of reminder, our Resurrection Sunday service will look at how the resurrection is the answer to every question. The great questions that humanity has pondered, the meaning of life, is there a God, what happens after this life, are all answered by the resurrection. We'll do a sunrise service, Lord willing, at 7 a.m. out under the pavilion, weather permitting. We will not have hospitality before that service. We will have abundant <laughs> hospitality, I'm told, afterwards. And that will be a family service, an all-ages service out under the pavilion. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. services will be mostly business as usual, nursery and children's church both happening, coffee flowing. Um, youth ministry will not be happening this weekend, though, so teens will sit in with their families or sit in with each other. But Sunday's coming, today is Friday. And church tradition says that Jesus was crucified on a Friday. I'm not necessarily convinced of that. There's an argument to be made, and I sent an article out this week in my news and notes email to, to those who are part of the, the church database. There's an argument to be made that Jesus was crucified on a Thursday. And I think we actually unpacked it together in some detail when we were studying Life of Christ a few years ago. But in a sense, it doesn't matter, because whatever day of the week it was, the timing of events that day, the sequence, the, the, how that day unfolded, doesn't change whether it was Thursday or Friday. And the sequence of events is relatively clear from Scripture. We have to toggle back and forth a little bit between the Gospels to pin it down. But it's not that much work. Tonight, as I post verses on the screens, we're going to stay in Matthew just for, for simplicity's sake. When necessary, um, I'll reference verses from Luke or Mark or John, if that's the only place where they appear. Most of what we're going to read about shows up in two or more Gospels. This is important stuff, and God records it more than once, almost all of it. So what do we know about that day? We know that sometime after midnight, Jesus was arrested. We know that sometime after he had the Passover supper with his disciples, he goes to the garden to pray and in the garden, he's arrested. I think that's what the children's church is focusing on tonight. I think that they've created a garden of Gethsemane down the hall. Sometime before dawn, Jesus, now under arrest, appears before Annas, the former high priest. And then before Caiaphas, the current high priest, along with some or all of the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, of the Jewish people. The problem was both of those hearings, trials, appearances, whatever we want to call them, they happened in the middle of the night. They happened before dawn in violation of Jewish law, which meant that whatever they decided, whatever findings they arrived at could be thrown out on a technicality. So, still before dawn, Jesus is taken to a holding area across the courtyard. And he's held there for several hours. During this time, Peter, who's made his way to that same courtyard, has an opportunity to align himself with Jesus, to declare his allegiance to Jesus. Instead, Peter denies Jesus three times. After dawn, which most people believe was around 6 a.m., it could have been as early as 4.30 a.m. if they'd really stuck to the letter of the law and gathered at first light. The Sanhedrin gathered once again to essentially rubber stamp what they'd already decided. They called false witnesses. They elicited uh, fallacious testimony. But, but even though it was, it was specious, it was legal in the sense that now it was done. 
And the Sanhedrin were determined not to let the facts get in the way of what they wanted to do. So they voted quickly and then delivered Jesus to Pilate. So the next thing that happens, the next scene that day, is Pilate interviewing Jesus. Pilate, the governor of Judea, he would be the one who would need to give the order if Jesus were to be put to death. One problem, Pilate realizes that he's innocent, and he declares Jesus to be innocent. But Jesus' accusers aren't going to accept this answer. They refuse to accept this answer. So Pilate quickly realizes he's in a no-win situation. He's east of rock and west of hard place because he either condemns an innocent man to die, and his wife, by the way, has warned him, have nothing to do with this guy. It's not going to end well. He either condemns an innocent man to die, or he might be the next one with a target on his back. Pilate decides that the discretion is the better part of valor. He decides to duck. He sends... Jesus to Herod, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee. Jesus, for all intents and purposes, was from Galilee. That's where he did most of his ministry. He sends Jesus to Herod. He says, he's your problem. He's one of your guys. You figure it out. Except Jesus refuses to play along. He won't answer any of Herod's questions. Even when Herod mocks him, tries to provoke him, he remains silent. Herod gets pretty tired of this pretty quickly. This is no fun. He pokes, Jesus won't poke back. He sends Jesus back to Pilate. At which point Pilate tries another approach. He said, wait a minute, this is Passover. And it's customary on the Passover to free a prisoner. So he offers to free Jesus. He says to the Jewish people, I I always free someone during your feast day. What what if it's Jesus? That way you get to to believe that he's guilty, but you also don't have, we don't have to, we don't have to kill anyone here. But the people have been ripped, whipped into a frenzy by their leaders at this point, and their chant is, give us Barabbas. Barabbas, who is a terrorist and a thug and a murderer. So reluctantly, Pilate washes his hands. He says, okay, this is what you want. It's on you. And he orders Jesus to be scourged. That was a necessary preliminary to being crucified. And we're familiar with scourging, right? Leather straps knotted together in a whip. Pieces of glass, pieces of metal, pieces of bone tied into those leather thongs. And together, used repeatedly to flay the person who would be crucified, essentially beating their body into hamburger. Having scourged Jesus, the soldiers then led him away to Calvary, to Golgotha, to the place of the skull to be crucified. And we talked last year, last year? Year before, I think, about that journey. Journey in which Jesus was mocked. Journey in which he started off carrying the cross beam of his cross himself, but weak from blood loss week from the beating that he'd received. He was assisted by Simon of Cyrene, and we talked about Simon, talked about the people who followed as Jesus and Simon made their way to Calvary, the women that Jesus talked to along the way. When Jesus and the soldiers accompanying him and the people following him reached Golgotha, the crossbeam would have been put on the ground so that Jesus' arms could be stretched out the full length of it, and his hands, perhaps his wrists, nailed to the beam. And then the beam with Jesus attached would be lifted onto a a post permanently set in the ground, and his feet nailed to that vertical post, upon which he would die slowly from shock and suffocation. All of that happened. And it's staggering every time I step back and realize this again. All of that happened before 9 a.m. Mark 15, 25 tells us it was the third hour as the crucifixion began. And between 9 a.m. when Jesus was elevated 
onto the cross, Jesus spoke three times, at at least three times that are recorded. He may have said more things, but the things that are recorded in Scripture, we talked about this Good Friday of last year. The young men and women from 10th Hour were with with us, and we used our, our Good Friday to examine the seven statements of Jesus on the cross. The first, Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. As the soldiers gambled for his clothing, Jesus was crucified naked. So he wasn't going to need it anymore. That probably happened close to 9 a.m. They wouldn't have wasted any time dividing up Jesus' possessions. And then most likely closer to noon, Luke 23, 43, Jesus says to the thief who was repentant, today you'll be with me in paradise. And in John 19, we read that Jesus says to his mother, woman, behold your son, and to John, his disciple, behold your mother. And that's pretty much all we know about the first three hours. But at noon, something interesting happens. Matthew 27, 45, our home verse for the evening. From the sixth hour, noon, in uh, Jewish reckoning, until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., there was darkness over all the land. That's Matthew 27, 45. Luke and Mark tell us the same thing. At noon, brightest part of the day, sun highest in the sky, the sky suddenly fell dark and remained dark for three hours. Just before 3 p.m., Jesus spoke four more times. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? pointing anyone in earshot to Psalm 22, which was being fulfilled. I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And at 3 p.m., he yielded his spirit. He allowed himself to die. At which point the soldiers confirmed that he was dead. They were surprised that he died so quickly. They were getting ready to break his legs to accelerate the process because as it was, somebody being crucified needed to pull themselves up by their hands and by their feet. They needed to leverage themselves from the nails to take each breath. Breaking the legs would leave someone with only their arms to to, to lift themselves into a position where their lungs could fill. That would greatly accelerate the process. But when they arrived to break Jesus' legs, he was already dead, fulfilling the prophecy that said that not a bone would be broken. At that point, Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate, asked permission to claim the body. He was granted permission. Joseph of Arimathea, assisted by Nicodemus, wraps Jesus' body hastily in linen, interrs him in a tomb that Joseph had recently acquired with a plan to come back on Sunday and finish the job after the Sabbath. But let's rewind to the middle of the day because that's our focus this evening. Matthew 27, 45, it's noon. It's the middle of the day. It's the brightest part of the day. The sun is at the the highest point in the sky and darkness falls over the land. Last year, we focused on what Jesus said on the cross, what he said and what it meant. But, but in doing so, we, we, we plunged past what was happening as Jesus hung on the cross. What's up with this darkness? First of all, was there darkness? Did it really happen? If it happened, what was it? What did it mean? And what does it mean for, for you and I? That's our outline for this evening. Let's take the first question first, because that's how lists work. Did the darkness that Matthew and Mark and Luke all talk about actually happen? might seem like a dopey question. The Bible just said that it did. But is it possible that it was a metaphor, poetical language to describe the tragedy that was unfolding? You know, it was a dark day kind of a thing. And it doesn't sound poetic language the way we read it in Scripture, if we read it in context. And if we look at secular history, if we look at non-biblical, non-Christian sources, we can actually verify it wasn't poetic language. 
the darkness the gospel writers refer to did actually happen. 52 AD, Thallus was writing a history of the Mediterranean world, 20 years or so after the crucifixion, almost instantly in historical terms. And he records a day of extended darkness. 137 AD, the Greek historian Phlegon records very specifically a day of darkness that happened in 33 AD that began at the sixth hour and was accompanied by an earthquake. Well, hang on, Patrick. Uh, 137 AD, that's like 100 years later. For perspective, though, in historical terms, that's not a long time. Most of what we know about Julius Caesar was written 110 years after his death. And no one particularly questions it. The best information we have about Alexander the Great was written 400 years after his death, and it's considered reliable. So we have reliable accounts that speak of darkness that day, and there seem to have been other accounts lost to history. How do we know? Because they're quoted by other writers whose material we do have. Second century church leader Tertullian responds to a letter by an atheist saying at the moment of Christ's death the light departed from the sun and the land was darkened at noonday which wonder is related in your own annals he's saying don't take my word for it look in Roman archives look in secular historical records you'll you'll find writing about it it's preserved in your archives to this day Roman historian Rufinus quotes Lucian of Antioch, speaking around 312 AD, who also references Roman archives. Go to the library, he says. Search your writings, and you shall find that in Pilate's time, when Christ suffered, the sun was suddenly withdrawn and darkness followed. And we could keep going, but I think that's enough to reassure us. This isn't a metaphor. Darkness happened. So that takes us to our second question. What was it? What was going on? The writers I mentioned earlier, Thallus, Flagg, and other secular historians, often refer to this darkness, the darkness that accompanied Christ's execution, as an eclipse. Flagg says, in the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, 33 AD to you and me, there was, quote, the greatest eclipse of the sun. Thallus says similar things. One problem that's actually impossible. There's actually three problems with the eclipse theory, at least. One, there was no solar eclipse in Israel between 21 AD and 40 AD. Best guess is that Jesus was crucified 32, 33 AD, so go 10 years on either side. No solar eclipse happened. That's the first problem. It's not the biggest problem. The second problem it's impossible for a solar eclipse to last more than eight minutes. In fact, it's impossible for it to last more than, I think it's seven minutes and 43 seconds. Scientifically impossible. The longest eclipse in recorded history happened on June 15th, 743 BC. It was seven minutes and 32 seconds. Third problem, and maybe this is the biggest of all, when was Jesus crucified? On the Passover. What's true about the Passover? It happens on a full moon. The Jewish calendar is aligned with the lunar calendar, and it's impossible for a solar eclipse to happen during a full moon. So it wasn't an eclipse. What was it? What caused this darkness? Easy answer it was a miracle. No scientific explanation. That doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that it happened from supernatural causes. And it apparently extended at least regionally, if not globally. Apparently the darkness was experienced throughout Israel, maybe further. There are some reports of midday darkness in China at that time. Now, those sources are a little sketchy. They're not completely reliable. But there are better sources that record Dionys uh, Dionysus, 
Dionysus from Acts 17, talking about how when he was still an unbeliever, he was an unsaved heathen living in Egypt, he observed darkness in the middle of the day. And at least one researcher claims to have accumulated records and, and, and manuscripts talking about darkness in Rome and Athens and other Mediterranean cities. So the darkness Matthew described happened. It was supernatural. It was widespread, regional if not global. What did it mean? What did it mean that at the time that the sun is normally bright in the sky, everything went dark? And the sense that we get from the gospel writers is that it was a sudden, thick, intrusive darkness. What did it mean? What was God saying? I said earlier that darkness wasn't a metaphor. Probably a better way of saying that is that it wasn't just a metaphor. It had meaning because everything God does has meaning. And the fact that it began when it began is, 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 is got to be God waving and calling attention to the fact, hey, there's something here to pay attention to. The fact that it began at noon, he's begging us to look for meaning. And we don't have to look far. Scripture talks about darkness a lot. The idea of darkness is rich with meaning. And it's all negative. Darkness in Scripture means emptiness. Genesis 1-2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Darkness means emptiness in Scripture. Darkness means judgment. Exodus 10-22. The plagues of Egypt. Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. Darkness means judgment. Darkness means evil. Job 30, 26. Job says, when I looked for good, evil came to me. What was that like, Job? When I waited for light, then came darkness. Darkness associated with evil. Darkness used in Scripture as a synonym for foolishness, for human wisdom as opposed to divine wisdom. Ecclesiastes 2.14, the wise man's eyes are in his head, Solomon says, but the fool walks in darkness. Wise in his own ways. Darkness also means spiritual blindness. Isaiah 9.2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Speaking of Israel after the return of Christ. Light is the opposite of darkness Revelation, the opposite of blindness. Darkness perhaps most plainly means sin. John 3, 19, this is the condemnation. What is John? That the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We didn't want the light because we were too busy enjoying what we were doing in the darkness. We were in love with our own sin. Finally, darkness describes the power of Satan. Acts 26, 18, God speaking to Paul, speaks of the power of the gospel to open their eyes, Israel and the Gentiles both, in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Darkness is where Satan reigns. So, so what do we make of all of that? That was great, Patrick. A little scripture machine gun going there. What do, you, what do we do with that? We, we step back and we, we survey it. And we say, wow, that's how great a metaphor God needed. That's, that's how intense a metaphor God constructed over a thousand years of biblical history to convey, to describe what was happening during those three hours. Because what was happening is everything we just read. It was emptiness and judgment and evil and foolishness and blindness and sin and Satan running wild. All of that gathered together, concentrated in one place. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord laid on Jesus, what? The iniquity of us all. 
all of our sin, all of our wickedness. He laid it on his son. That's a, that's a, that's a statement, that's a concept, one pastor said, that should stagger our minds. All of the sin of all of humanity heaped together all in one place, laid upon one person, a seething, tortured mass of wickedness and all of God's wrath for it, all at the same time. 2 Corinthians 5.21, same thing, fewer words. He became sin, and God treated him accordingly. Scientists tell us there's roughly 8 billion people in the world today. And, and many believe, although it's impossible to prove, that maybe half the people who have ever lived are alive right now. So that means 16 billion souls and counting in this experiment called humanity. And each one of those 16 billion souls deserves hell. Each one of those 16 billion souls has looked at right and looked at wrong and said, I'm all about wrong. The wages of sin is death. And when we talk about death, sin against an eternal God, that, that warrants eternal death. One person's sin warrants an eternity of wrath, a forever of punishment. And on the cross, Jesus bore 16 billion eternities of wrath, all concentrated, distilled, superintensified in those three hours. With all of that going on, the question, why darkness, that doesn't even make sense, does it? A better question, with all of that evil and blindness and emptiness and foolishness and judgment for it, all in one place, how could there be light? How does the Bible describe hell? Place of eternal punishment for sinners, Patrick. Yeah, right. What's it like? The location in which God's wrath is poured out. Matthew 22 in the parable of the wedding garment. We read of a lost sinner cast into outer darkness. Jude, verse 13, speaks of lost sinners as wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. On a wooden cross 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary, God didn't send Jesus to hell. God brought hell to Jesus complete with the agony and the sorrow and the isolation and the darkness. And Jesus wasn't surprised. He knew full well what was coming. Luke chapter 22, right after Jesus is seized in the garden, he says to the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders and everyone else who had come to arrest him, what's up with the soldiers? and the swords and the clubs. When I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. That's the New King James. The NASB translates that. This hour and the power of darkness are yours. Or the New Living Translation. This is your moment. The time when the power of darkness reigns. Jesus said that sometime between midnight and 9 a.m. I don't think anyone present, I don't think anyone who heard him, perhaps not even the angels themselves that Peter tells us are, are watching and keenly interested in, in what's unfolding, this whole business of salvation. I don't think the angels themselves fully knew the truth of Jesus' words 
that this would be the time in which the power of darkness would reign. I don't think anyone understood the extent to which the power of darkness would reign between noon and 3 p.m. I don't think anyone knew what would happen. I don't think anyone understood what it would be like, except for Jesus himself. They didn't know the meaning of his words. And nobody present, not even God the Father, witnessed the fulfillment of Jesus' words. What do you mean, not even God the Father? Habakkuk 1.3. The prophet Habakkuk says to God, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. God in his holiness cannot stare at unholiness, will not give his attention to wickedness. I think that's another reason for the darkness. God in his holiness, we sang this earlier, God in his holiness not only turned his face, his face away from Jesus, by shrouding the cross in darkness, he turned our eyes away as well. Perhaps this is, is along the same lines as, as the conversation God had with Moses. Moses says, I want to behold your glory. God says, no, you can't. You, you can't you, you, you're not equipped for it. You can't behold my glory and live. Is it possible that what was happening on the cross was a scene too horrible for mortal eyes to behold? For whatever reason, God turned his face away, blinded us to what was happening, and, and maybe deafened us as well. We're not told of any words spoken until almost 3 o'clock. Perhaps there were, but I think it's more likely that the silence was broken only by the sound of labored breathing as three men agonized to take each breath, two criminals and one innocent, lifting themselves up upon nails. Until just before 3 p.m., Jesus breaks the silence. He acknowledges the separation that's taken place between father and son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't asking a question. He knew the answer. He was pointing anybody listening to Psalm 22 saying that prophecy is being fulfilled in your hearing. It's happening right now. It's unfolding in real time. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It wasn't a question, but it didn't mean that the words weren't true. For the first time in all of eternity, God the Father had forsaken his Son. Had, in a very real sense, forsaken himself. A fellowship Consider this, a fellowship that had no beginning had found an end. As Jesus hung on the cross, tortured and rejected by men, smitten by God. Psalm 88, which is clearly messianic, and I don't understand people who don't see this. Psalm 88, beginning in verse 6, You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths, your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you've afflicted me with all your waves. Wave after wave after wave of judgment crashing down upon him. But then something happened. Something horrible and wonderful and undoubtedly a miracle all at the same time. And if the person next to you has nodded off, wake him up. Because the whole study has been building to this point. Don't miss this. Just before 3 p.m., Jesus breaks the silence. His voice is heard crying out of the darkness, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then, and then maybe, maybe hearing the strain in his own voice, he's, he's not able to summon the moisture to, to, to keep speaking, but he, he knows he has more to say. He croaks out, I, I thirst. And Scripture then tells us in a loud voice, having received some vinegar on, on his lips, he cries out, it is finished. And then a final prayer, maybe spoken, maybe whispered, 
Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then what happened? Then the darkness ended. Where, where, where does it say that? It, 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 it doesn't say it except that it does. Matthew 27, 45. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus spoke four times, gave us those four statements, and then it was the ninth hour. It was three in the afternoon. Jesus gave up his spirit. As he did, the veil in the temple was torn. The earth shook. Graves were opened. And what else? The sun came out. Darkness was driven out. It was light again. Why? What did Jesus say? To tell us die. Paid in full. Judgment was complete. God's wrath was satisfied. Sin and death and Satan were defeated. And on the other side of that light. Because what is light in Scripture? Easy to say it's the opposite of darkness. So instead of evil and foolishness and blindness and emptiness and the power of Satan, light is righteousness and goodness and wisdom, discernment, the presence and power of God, but it's all of that and it's more than that because besides all of that, light in Scripture is you know, Jesus. I'm the light of the world, Jesus told his followers, John 8, 12. And then he said something else, something powerful and wonderful. I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. If we follow him, if we repent of our sin and give our lives to him, we partake of his victory. We enter into his light. In the beginning was the word, John's gospel opens. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Didn't see it, didn't get it, didn't want it. This is the condemnation, Jesus continues in John chapter 3. This is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's the condemnation that all of us were under. That's the condemnation that Jesus took upon himself. That was, that was the portfolio of crime that Jesus was punished for. That was the debt that he paid. But having paid that price, John 8, 12, Jesus turns around and offers us that light again. I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, ever but have the light of life. That's how John could say years later, 1 John 2, 8, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because darkness is passing away and true light is already shining. True light was shining when John wrote that. It had been shining since the day that Jesus died. It had been shining since the moment that darkness ceased. And it shines for us today. My daughter reminded me of something yesterday. Because she does that. Something the Catholic altar boy in me probably used to know, but had long since forgotten. Good Friday and the Saturday that follows Good Friday are the only days the Roman Catholic Church doesn't celebrate communion. Doesn't have the sacrament of the Eucharist. And I should have remembered that because I served the Stations of the Cross service that the Catholic Church does in place of Mass on Good Friday every year. Because I was big enough to hold that big old iron cross. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't celebrate communion on Good Friday. We're going to. 
The Catholic Church doesn't. Why? Their reasoning is that communion is a celebration and Good Friday a day of mourning. Except that's not what we just read, is it? Catholic theology says that Jesus is still on the cross, still suffering, still atoning. And every time I sin, I'm driving another nail into his wrists. We just read that Jesus cried out in victory, it's finished. We just read that Jesus cried out to Telestai in victory, and then after that light burst, out of, burst forth out of darkness in testimony, that darkness and everything it was and everything that it meant was defeated. The light began to shine, and it continues to shine. And we should rejoice. Should, should Good Friday be a thoughtful day? Yeah. Should, it be a, should, should our remembrance of the cross be serious and substantial? Of course it should. Is, is pondering the price that Jesus paid and, and the love that prompted him to pay it, is that worthy of, of diligent meditation? Absolutely. But it's not only worthy, worthy of our meditation, it's worthy of our celebration, family. The light sh shone in darkness, and we who were in darkness didn't comprehend it, didn't want it, said no to it. We rejected it. We rejected him. But now we've got a second chance. Because of the cross, G Jesus purchased for us a second chance to follow him out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is there better news? Is there a greater reason to rejoice? I don't think so. It's interesting what Scripture says about darkness. Crucifixion isn't the only place in which it's prominent. Egypt, prior to the Exodus, we talked about that. Darkness for three days. But darkness also figures prominently in prophecy. Verses like Isaiah 50, verse 3. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. What's going on there? Blackness. We don't have to guess. It's all through Isaiah. Isaiah 13, beginning in verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord comes. That tells us that this is end times. This is future. This will happen. The day of the Lord comes cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. He'll destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. What will be going on? I will punish the word, the world, God says, for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll halt the arrogance of the proud and lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. One day God will remove the church from the world. Those who have renounced darkness and chosen light will be raptured. And God's judgment upon the world will begin. And darkness will once again figure prominently. God's signaling clearly to anybody paying attention. This is me. I'm signing my name. You should know what this is and what it means. And it's going to continue... Until what? Until Israel renounces darkness. Until Israel acknowledges what happened 2,000 years ago in the darkness. Until the remnant of Israel reaches out for the light. And it shall come to pass in that day, the day of the Lord. This is Amos. That I'll make the sun go down at noon and I'll darken the earth in broad daylight. Turn your feasts into mourning, your songs to lamentation sackcloth, baldness, I'll make it like mourning for an only son. Isn't that interesting? And it's end like a bitter day. Yeah, that's not an accident. That's deliberately, conspicuously evoking the crucifixion. But on the other side of Israel's repentance, Isaiah 58, then your light shall break forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily. 
Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. At the end of the tribulation, when Israel repents and Jesus returns, once again, light will burst forth out of darkness, even brighter than before. Brighter than, than, than light has ever shined. Why? Because the glory of the Lord will be in our midst. And God's instructions to Israel on that day, Isaiah 60, beginning in verse 1, Arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But on the other side of that, the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. And then the Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. And here's the point. God's instructions to Israel that day are his exhortation to you and I on this day, in our day. This is well-traveled ground for my Wednesday night friends. But we know in reading prophecy the things that will be true in the kingdom, the physical kingdom, the millennial kingdom, when Jesus is ruling and reigning on his throne in Jerusalem, the things that will be true in that day should be true in our day. Why? Where is the kingdom today? Jesus tells us the kingdom of God is in you. And so the things that we see in the physical kingdom when Jesus is physically ruling and reigning on his throne in Jerusalem are the things that should be true for us today if Jesus is ruling and reigning on the throne of our hearts. And one of the things that should be true, will be true for Israel then, should be true for us now, Christ followers should be light bearers. And we could have gotten there without a detour into prophecy, but that wouldn't have been as much fun. Either way, it's too important to ignore. And either way, we come back to the same place. What does the darkness of Good Friday teach us? What does it remind us of? What, what, what does it mean to us? We're called to rejoice in light. We're called out of darkness, John 12, 36. We no longer have to abide in darkness, John 12, 46, and, and we shouldn't. We don't need to have any fellowship with darkness, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Through the power of the Spirit, we get to cast off works of darkness, Romans 13, 12. And having done all that, we get to bring light and share light and be light to those who still remain in darkness. Romans 2.19. As Hannah comes back up, let's take some time to ponder those truths. The, the reality of them, the application of them to our lives, uh, personally, individually. We deferred worship at the beginning of service wanted to reserve it for here, for now, for, for after the message. So having heard all of that and, and pondering all that, we'd have time to pray and consider, God, what is it for me today to come out of darkness? What does it look like for, for me to walk in light? The easy application of this, of course, is the gospel. If you're here tonight and you've never taken that step to accept the price that Jesus paid on the cross, to follow him out of darkness, to believe that his death paid the price for your sin, that, that's, that, that's the first and most important application that, that you'll ever make. If you're here tonight and you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never made up your mind about the cross, would you consider in, in, in this time of, of prayer and worship what, what's holding you back? Why wouldn't you? What doesn't make sense? What don't you believe? And, and if you have a question, if if there is something standing in your way, after the service, please, let's talk about it. But perhaps it's just that no one has ever asked. No one has ever invited you. No one has ever said, hey, you need to. 
And if that's, if that's you, oh, please know that you need to. The wrath that Jesus bore on the cross, he bore so that you wouldn't have to. But until you say yes, until you receive that gift, you can't give someone a gift against their will, and, and God won't. Until you say yes to the freedom and the forgiveness that Jesus purchased on the cross, then that eternity of wrath that we talked about, that, that forever of darkness and torture, that's still waiting. Why not make a decision to trade places with Jesus? That's the offer that he makes. He says, come to me. Give me all of your sin. I'll pay for it. And I'll give you all of your righteousness, all of my righteousness. The garment that, that purchase our admission to the wedding feast. But even for those of us who have taken that step, who have said yes to Jesus, we know Paul's been reminding us in Ephesians there's three tenses of our salvation. We've been brought out of darkness. One day we'll be brought out of darkness and, and we'll be liberated from these sinful bodies that still war with us and drag us down. But between the already and the not yet, are we being brought out of darkness? Are we letting God bring us out of darkness? Are we still following him into the light?